Thanks, everyone. You're too kind. Um, hopefully, you're seeing my graphics. Um, so, the uh, the graphic that we put on the front of our presentation here today, um, carbon dioxide, the problem of the past or the fuel of the future, really depicts someone in the future, maybe in the 22nd century, looking back on what we have today. And this graphic's kind of been bugging me all week, and I couldn't quite figure out what it was that was bugging me about it until last night when I was doing a run-through, and I realized it's because you can't actually see their face. You don't know whether they're happy or sad, and I hope through this um, next 10 minutes or so that you um, can imagine with me that maybe they come out feeling happy with what we can do today and how we can progress with the energy transition that we need to go through in the next years. So I've been working in the oil and chemical industries for 30 years and uh, through that period uh, I've been exposed to the most amazing revolutions and many of those have been hidden from the, you know, the wider public. If you think back to acid rain, that's really not an issue anymore. We've taken out more than 99.5% of sulfur from all the petrol and all the diesel that we use. If you think about ozone depletion, the chemicals industry rallied very quickly and replaced chlorofluorocarbons with alternatives, and now we're actually seeing the ozone layer is repairing itself very, very slowly over time. And today, we're still continuing with those innovations. We're using biomimicry to recover heat that was previously just wasted to atmosphere and boost that temperature up so that we can then use it in the processes. We're using artificial intelligence to control process plants so that we can produce more petrol and diesel per barrel of crude. If we run less crude, we use less energy and we make less emissions. These things are just incredible. Behind this, there's this human ingenuity and creativity that just continues to stagger me. And I've been so happy to have been involved in the industry over those years. And you have to you know, take account of the fact the industry has a bad image, but actually there's a lot of really good stuff going on inside. So let's talk about the challenge of the energy transition that we have to go through. Now, I'm talking about global energy in 10 minutes, and it's a massive subject, so I'm going to bring it right down to just about the UK, and the challenges that the UK faces today are very similar to other nations around the world. Everyone will have their own specificities, but they will be of a similar kind of nature to the way that we deal with them in the UK. So if we look at the UK, how big is the challenge we face? The UK uses 2019, 227,000 million watts of energy. Now that is a big number with a lot of zeros and doesn't really mean a lot to people um, day to day. Every household consumes two, 2,000 watts of electricity and gas. That's what you pay your bill. So that means that that energy amount is 114 million households worth. But that just isn't right because there are only 28 million households in the UK. And the reason is for every unit of energy that we use in our households, we cause another three units to be used indirectly elsewhere in the economy. Also important to point out, I'm talking about total energy. I'm not just talking about electricity. Electricity, we generate 34,000 million watts. And again, another big, big number but it's actually only 15% of the total energy consumption of the country. So let's look at where that energy comes from. Everyone's very excited about wind and solar and tidal and things like that. But actually, on a total energy point of view, we only use 4%. Staggeringly, 78% of our total energy still comes from oil, gas and coal. And although we've done a great job of winding down coal consumption over time, in 2019, we still used as much coal as the entire production of Greece or Romania or Bulgaria. So we've still got a lot of work to do. If we look at where the energy goes, it's not going to industry. People think industry consumes this vast volume of energy, 17% to industry. 
76% of our energy consumption can be traced back to each one of us as individuals. It's for our petrol and diesel in cars, it's for heating and lighting our houses, it's for running offices, supermarkets, shipping materials around, it's for municipal um, purposes like transport, buses, trains and so on. So we each have a part to play in this energy transition. We have to change our behaviours as well as having big activities done by government to help us to uh, enable that. So what are the solutions out there? If we look at the UK, we're really focused on nuclear, solar and wind power. And they all have their pros and cons. We're building Hinkley Point C at the moment. It's going to take about a decade to complete. It's a very, very complicated project to deliver, but it's an amazing increase in our power availability, about 3,000 megawatts in one go. If you compare that to solar, solar you can deliver a solar farm in a matter of months, maybe a year or two max. So this Lineham solar farm here is one of the biggest ones in the UK, 68 megawatts of capacity. But in the UK, we don't necessarily get a lot of sun, so on average, we deliver about seven megawatts. That compares to the 3,000 megawatts of the Hinkley Point. But you can see on the picture, it consumes a vast amount of land. Wind comes somewhere in between, expensive, especially offshore wind, because you're working offshore with big, heavy equipment, it's hard to install, so costs a fair bit. We're also using a lot of sea area if you compare Lynham, 400 acres, to, Hink, to Hornsey 1, Hornsey 1 is 100,000 acres of sea. Now, just to give a comparison, if we were to build a solar farm the same size as Hinkley Point C, 3,000 megawatts, we'd need 420 Lynhams, or the land area three times the Liverpool metropolitan city region. So clearly solar on its own doesn't work, and that's why a mix of different ones helps, not least because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So you need a steady source of, of energy as well. So let's look at how we've been doing on CO2. Actually, not too bad, but mostly driven by the blue bar reducing. That's coal. We've been driving coal out of our energy mix consistently year on year, and there's some big announcements on coal this week at COP26, which is really promising. If we could keep the rate that we've been doing in the last 15 years, we'll get to net zero in the mid-2040s, but that 35% reduction we've done in the last 15 years is going to be harder for the next 35% and the 35% beyond that. So we're going to have to work harder and harder and harder over time to achieve that net zero objective. So scorecard is not too bad. We still have this massive mountain to climb. Can we decarbonize our power generation? Absolutely. I don't think there's any problem in doing that. But remember, power is 15% of our energy consumption. The other sectors, industry, transport, and domestic um, heating and lighting, they're a tougher problem. And we need a mixture of solutions to decarbonize those. Every time you translate energy from one source to another, you lose efficiency. You're wasting energy. So we need to electrify as much of our energy consumption as possible so we can directly use renewable energy. But that won't be enough. Even in 2050, we'll still be using fossil-based energy. So to avoid the emissions, We've got to use technology like carbon capture to avoid that carbon getting into the atmosphere. We need to be using plant-based carbon neutral energy as well. Now, you may not have even noticed, but September the 1st this year, the UK and Europe switched from 5% bioethanol in petrol to 10% bioethanol, if you see the pump markings. Now, that overnight reduced our oil related uh, to petrol by 5%. Energy conservation is something that we can all help with. Um, if we can cut the top off that decarbonization mountain, it makes the, the job a little bit easier. But finally, I'm a hydrogen geek. Green hydrogen in particular 
is the way forward. Hydrogen from water and renewable energy. It's a technology that's been around for about 100 years. Split water apart into hydrogen and oxygen. And that hydrogen we need to decarbonize the heavy industry users, steel, cement, and so on, which we can't electrify. So let's talk about CO2. Nice pint of Guinness. Is CO2 such a bad thing? Well, when you read daily about um, climate change, CO2 is a bad thing, and I'm not going to tell you any different to that. But recently, September this year, you may have seen this in the press, why is there a CO2 shortage? Now, it's kind of bizarre. We put 350 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year, but we're short of CO2. And the answer is, it's the wrong kind of CO2. So we use CO2 for all kinds of things in our daily life, daily staples, for, from preserving fruit and, and meat, from distributing those in cold vehicles around the countryside, promoting plant growth in greenhouses, water treatment, sterilizing medical equipment, baking bread, uh, beer and soft drinks, and filling fire extinguishers. So we use a lot of CO2 just in daily activities. Sorry, I'm a chemical engineer. I have to have a flow diagram somewhere in the thing. The reason for this CO2 supply shortage is ammonia and fertilizers. Up on Teesside, there are some really big ammonia plants, and they take natural gas and convert it to ammonia, and the ammonia to fertilizers, and they produce this food-grade carbon dioxide byproduct. Now, recently, we've seen gas prices spike up dramatically, and these ammonia plants became unprofitable, and oper the operators were considering to shut the plants down, which would have meant we would have lost that food-grade carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so the government needed to step in, support those operations to produce CO2. So now we have this bizarre situation where we're burning natural gas just to make CO2 to use for food? Like, how does this even work? Now, in the future, uh, so historically, that's actually been good for these ammonia plants because it's kind of made them lower carbon than other ammonia plants in the world. But in the future, we want ammonia to be a zero carbon operation. So what does that look like? Um, to go on. We, uh, we have green hydrogen, which I mentioned before, um, and green nitrogen from, from the atmosphere. We make green ammonia and fertilizers. The problem is we've lost that CO2 that we linked into the old operation. So we need an alternative source of CO2. And we need to forge a new link into that new source of CO2. Now we have plenty of industrial plants and power plants that are producing CO2 currently going to the atmosphere, so we need to use carbon capture to provide that food grade CO2. Methanol. Does anyone even know what methanol is? Methanol is a really, really versatile chemical, but it's kind of hidden away behind a lot of our daily life. We use it to make plastics, we use it to make spectacle lenses, polycarbonates, um, paint, adhesives, pharmaceuticals, synthetic fibers. It's used to make, uh, within the manufacturing of plywood, antifreeze. Um, in China, they use it to replace uh, petrol for, for cars. And looking forward, the shipping industry is looking at it as a marine fuel, a low carbon marine fuel. So it's a really, really versatile chemical that touches us probably every day. Now, how do we make methanol? Natural gas, coal, carbon emissions, the usual story. Can we make methanol in a greener way? Sure, green hydrogen again, my favorite. We need a source of CO2. Again, not a problem. We link it to an industrial facility, capture the carbon, and we use that. And we start to think of CO2 as a material that has some value rather than an environmental pollutant. Here we're now thinking about displacing carbon atoms from natural gas and now using CO2 that we would have put to the atmosphere as a feedstock. 
So a very, very different proposition. So previously I talked about our, um, our own impact on energy consumption and the fact that 76% of our energy can be traced back to each of us as individuals. So we can all do something to help to drive this transition and this change looking ahead. But what are those things? We need to go to more plant-based material, sustainably sourced. Plant-based packaging in particular displaces plastics, which reduces the amount of oil consumption and, and fossil fuels that we are using to produce that. We need to monitor and manage our own energy consumption carefully. Energy today is too cheap. We need to treat energy like it's gold. If we have the opportunity, we should generate our own power. And we need to move towards electricity from all other sources of, power, uh, of energy. From gas, we need to drive green and we use, need to use more public transport because public transport is also moving towards electrical power and towards hydrogen. And finally, and definitely not least, we need to reuse and recycle anything and everything that comes from fossil fuels. Keep those fossil fuels in the ground, keep those plastics from being produced. Now I hope our person in the 22nd century has got a smile on their face because I'm really optimistic. The human energy that goes into the energy industry is incredible and I think we have a reason to be optimistic. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>